Hello, my name is Rodrigo Vega and I am a senior lecturer in biology and a molecular ecologist at Canterbury Christchurch University. Welcome to Summertime Science. Molecular ecology tries to solve questions in traditional ecology, for example, what determines the abundance and distribution of individuals and populations, their behavior, their interactions with other species, species conservation, biodiversity and behavioral ecology, but using molecular techniques that have been borrowed from other areas, for example, molecular biology. As an integrative discipline, molecular ecology brings the best from different areas of biology, for example, molecular biology, genetics, cell biology, phylogenetics, systematics, bioinformatics, statistics, and of course, tools that we normally use in ecology. There are many examples in molecular ecology where the tools or techniques that we normally use were developed first in other areas of research that had nothing to do with ecology. For example, DNA sequencing was applied first in microbial genetics, in human biology and in biomedical research and, and in genetics in general. But then the same techniques became available for ecologists who started using them for asking questions uh, important for the discipline. For example, what is the genetic diversity of populations or the species? What are the genealogical relationships among individuals in a population? Can we use this DNA information for conservation? Another example, more recently, next generation DNA sequencing, also known as high throughput DNA sequencing, was also used first in microbial genetics, in genomics, human biology, and biomedical research. But nowadays, these techniques are typical of molecular ecology studies. You might have heard about a new molecular tool called CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9. It has been mentioned many times in the news, newspapers, and in social media. It is sometimes referred to as molecular scissors or as a new gene editing tool. Today I would like to tell you about an interesting research article, this one, that uses CRISPR system technology for molecular ecology, opening new and exciting possibilities in molecular ecology research. But before I talk about this paper and its relevance in ecological research, I need to explain uh, some fundamental aspects. For example, what is CRISPR? The CRISPR system is a natural curing genome editing tool. It evolved in prokaryotes, that means bacteria and archaea, protecting them from invading viruses or bacteriophages. A famous CRISPR system is called CRISPR-Cas9. It's perhaps the one you have heard the most. But there are many others. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. This basically means that it's a piece of genomic DNA of a prokaryote, so it's a prokaryotic locus of palindromic DNA, that means that DNA sequence reads the same this way to that way and from this way to that way in the complementary DNA sequences. So it reads the same 5 prime, 3 prime directions and in the 3 prime, 5 prime direction. And those palindromic sequences are repeated several times and in between them they have a spacer DNA which is of viral origin between those palindromic sequences. Cas9 is a type of DNA cutting enzyme. It's encoded by CRISPR associated or Cas gene or genes. And it also has an RNA molecule, thus forming a protein and RNA complex. The RNA molecule is called single guy RNA or sgRNA and contains complementary information to the viral DNA from which originated from and information from the palindromic repeated DNA. The CRISPR system is therefore formed by a DNA cutting protein and the single guide RNA molecule, together forming the Cas9 complex, and also the CRISPR locus which is used for making the single guide RNAs. The job of the Cas9 complex is to find a matching viral DNA sequence. Once it found it, it cuts the viral DNA, making it inoperative. 
the other cast complexes are the ones that cut the viral DNA, but also keeps part of that viral DNA and incorporates it into the bacterial genome between the CRISPR sequence repeats. You may think of the CRISPR system as the immunological memory or adaptive immunological memory of prokaryotes against viruses. Nowadays, we can use CRISPR as a genome engineering technology to easily and precisely edit the DNA of any genome. We can use it to knock out specific genes. We can use it to mutate specific DNA bases and change them to a new base that we want to promote or to silence gene transcription or to attach fluorescent proteins to specific target DNA sequences. Most, if not all, of this research has been done in biotech, in molecular biology, genomic studies, etc. But they have not yet been used in molecular ecology. There's another piece of CRISPR-based technology that is called Sherlock. Sherlock stands for Specific High Sensitivity Enzymatic Reporter Unlocking and uses a cousin of Cas9 complex called Cas13A that binds and cleaves or breaks RNA rather than viral DNA. Cas13A also has the functional capability to indiscriminately cleave any RNA molecule after it detects a specific target sequence. This is called collateral cleavage. Sherlock can be coupled with a fluorescently labeled RNA reporter that is quenched or turned off when it is intact and that emits fluorescence when it has been cleaved or turned on by the Cas13A complex. Sherlock can then be used as a diagnostic test to detect specific RNA or DNA even at low molecular concentrations. Sherlock has been used for detecting viruses in clinical isolates like serum or urine. Sherlock works by amplifying RNA or DNA with a reverse transcriptase using a process called recombinase polymerase amplification. This is very similar to PCR, but in this case it's an isothermal nucleic acid amplification. This means that unlike PCR, which requires different temperatures, isothermal nucleic acid amplification uses just one set temperature. The amplified sequences are combined with the Sherlock Cas13A. If the target nucleotide sequence is present in the pool of amplified sequences, the non-specific RNA's activity of the Cas13A becomes activated and the RNA reporter will be cleaved, that means it will be turned on, resulting in the activation of the fluorophore generating flu a fluorescent signal. Now, there are instruments that can detect this signal and this means that the target sequence is present in the sample. So Sherlock has all the characteristics needed for working in an ecological setting. It has rapid detection. It has single temperature reaction conditions. The instrumentation is relatively simple. It has, or has been shown to have high sensitivity, can detect very few molecules of the target sequence, and comparatively with other techniques, it has a relatively low cost, which makes it ideal for ecologists and molecular ecologists. So now that I explained briefly how CRISPR and Sherlock works, here I would like to highlight how a CRISPR-based technique, which has been used in human, plant and animal sciences, can now be used in molecular ecology. So published in 2020, Melinda Berwell and co-authors wrote Rapid and Accurate Species Identification for Molecular Studies and Monitoring using CRISPR-based Sherlock. This has been published in the scientific journal Molecular Ecology Resources, and I will provide you the link at the end of this presentation. Beerwald and colleagues engineer a Sherlock DNA assay that do not require DNA extraction or specialized equipment to genetically distinguish three morphologically similar fish species. 
they chose to work with the U.S. threatened and the Californian danger Delta smelt, Hypomesis transpacificus, the California threatened longfin smelt, Sperincus thalectis, and the non-native Wakasagi, Hypomesis niponensis. These are particularly difficult to distinguish morphologically at younger life stages. So there is an, an interest from ecologists to be able to identify them in the field, regardless of the life stage. Their study is just a proof of principle that their Sherlock DNA assay can be reliably used in a variety of ecological and environmental monitoring settings to obtain accurate, sensitive and rapid genetic results. Accurate species identification is essential for ecological research and environmental monitoring of rare and invasive species, for example. However, this is sometimes very difficult to do because some species don't show many morphological characteristics that distinguish them from others, or it takes lots of expertise and time to tell species apart. One tool that has been used is DNA barcoding for genetic identification, and it is often considered more accurate than, than other techniques. But it is also time consuming and requires training and a lab, and you require previous genetic identification and the generation of DNA library for genetic identification of a species. So in these papers by Bearwall and co-authors, they developed a field deployable genetic based approach that would allow molecular ecologists and non-molecular biologists to quickly identify species in the field. This real-time knowledge of target species would benefit, for example, year-round ecological monitoring programs, for example, when dealing with wildlife take by fisheries or when monitoring for invasive species. In this article that I'm presenting, the authors use CRISPR single-guide RNAs, a cas protein called LW-Cas13A, so it's a cas in Cas9 and a reported RNA for implementing the Sherlock assay. They use published mitochondrial cytochrome B sequences for the three fish species to identify diagnostic DNA polymorphisms between the species. This means that they were looking for unique DNA signatures in each fish species. With this information, they then generated primers to amplify DNA containing those unique sequences using a technique called isothermal amplification, so this type of PCR that uses one set of temperatures, using a method called recombinase polymerase amplification. The species-specific DNA would then be detected by their Sherlock assay. They then needed fish DNA. DNA for this project was extracted from a tiny piece of the caudal fin tissue of three species of smelt, but they also tested their assay on 24 non-target fish species found throughout the same geographical range as all the three smelts, just in case their Sherlock assay would cross-react with all the species. But getting DNA from caudal fin using a DNA extraction method is time consuming and also requires uh, equipment. So for a quick field assay, they needed to obtain fish DNA using a non-extraction method. They retested their Sherlock assay using fish mucus obtained by passing swabs along the lateral line of the fish and by placing those swabs directly in a saline buffer solution to obtain the DNA. Fish mucus is abundant and covers all epithelial surfaces, is easy to collect in the field, and most importantly, it's non-invasive. The authors originally detected fluorescence from Sherlock Cas13A reactions using an expensive real-time PCR detection system. So to lower the cost of the assay, they also devised a method to detect Sherlock reactions using commercially available lateral flow strips, which are coated with an antigen labeled reporters. 
lateral flow strips are pretty much like pregnancy tests, but instead of detecting a human hormone, what they do is that they can detect a specific reporter in the Sherlock assay. And the image of the lateral flow strips can then be collected by taking a simple photo using a smartphone. Using this technique, they found that all fish individuals amplify for the species-specific assay and no individuals cross-amplify for non-target species assays. So they obtain 100% species specificity, which is very important in this case for, for biomonitoring. There were also no false positives in the Sherlock assays. The limits of detections were effective for reliably detecting the mitochondrial and cytochrome B target, even when the DNA concentrations were very low. The minimum positive detection time was actually less than 20 minutes for very little input DNA. So this is about two point times more rapid than a traditional test based on quantitative PCR. Even without the DNA extraction method, just by simply swirling the swabs in tubes containing the saline buffer, they detected Sherlock fluorescence with high specificity and performance, reducing the processing time, and again, this was ideal for field applications. So the visual or equipment-free Sherlock assay using the lateral flow strips show positive visual bands for each species-specific assay one hour after the reaction start, but they managed to bring down that time to 40 minutes after the reaction time, twice the time needed to conduct the genetic identification using a fluorescence reader, but at least they are not using uh, expensive equipment. So they conclude that this loss in speed will need to be considered against the convenience of using equipment-free detection method. The authors also anticipate that the entire protocol from sampling of the fish to genetic identification could be done all in all less than an hour. This pretty much enables near real-time species diagnostics in the field. So, this CRISPR-based Sherlock assay is another excellent example of how the developments in one area find their way to all the disciplines. The same tools that have been made the news as a gene editing tool or as a virus detection tool can now be used to detect and identify species in the wild. It is a good example of how new techniques, or molecular techniques, can be quickly adapted to answer different questions for problems that were not even originally considered by the people who developed the original tools. Ecologists, like other scientists, use a great diversity of tools in our never-ending quest to understand the world that surrounds us. Today, I'll show you how a recently developed molecular tool, CRISPR-Cas9, can help us answer fundamental questions in ecology. In this case, Berwald and co-authors show a proof of concept, a principle, a proof of principle that CRISPR-based Sherlock can be reliably used for environmental monitoring to obtain accurate, sensitive, and rapid genetic results. New technologies, including CRISPR, second and third generation high throughput DNA sequences, advances in bioinformatics and statistical approaches, and in artificial intelligence, eventually find their way into the molecular ecology toolkit. Equipped with these tools, but most importantly, with the scientific method, with our curiosity and our ingenuity, is how we can tackle and beat our own ignorance, and how we can study ecological patterns and processes in the world that surrounds us. I hope you found this short talk interesting and that you might want to go and read a little bit more about CRISPR or Sherlock about this paper maybe. Thank you for listening and keep an eye open for more of our summertime science. I am Rodrigo Vega from Canterbury Christchurch University. Have a good day.